Hey all, Tom Moran here from Tom's Big Spiders. This one's going to be the next in my line of featured tarantula species where I try to go a little more in depth into some of the care of the species that I have a lot of experience with. The idea of this one is instead of just doing a rehousing video and spewing some notes that we'll kind of focus, get some good images of the spiders, maybe some rehousings, maybe some feedings while I give every little detail about their upkeep that I can think of. For this species, we're going to be doing Serotogyrus darlingi or the rear horned baboon. I've actually raised five of these awesome species, really cool looking, especially with that horn on the back. And I've had a ton of people ask for information on them over the years. So I actually picked some more up a couple of years ago, A, because I wanted them, but B, because I wanted to raise some more up and do this video. So here we are, we are ready to roll. Enough of me talking, let's get into a husbandry video on the rear horn baboon or Ceratogyrus darlingi. The Ceratogyrus darlingi or rear horn baboon is an amazing little spider that gets its common name from a black horn that grows from its carapace. Unlike the foveal horns of the other Ceratogyrus species, the C. darlingi's protuberance slants toward the back of the spider. Although the purpose of this horn is still up for speculation, this unique feature makes for an incredibly cool ornamentation. The Ceratogyrus darlingi is a unique little old world species that hails from the savanna biomes in the countries of Botswana, Mozambique, and Zimbabwe in South Africa. Here the spider experiences a climate that sees both a hot dry season as well as a rainy season and temperatures that range from 68 degrees Fahrenheit to 88 degrees Fahrenheit or 20 degrees Celsius to 31 degrees Celsius. As a result, the C. darlingi does well at normal room temperatures, which for most of us is upper 60s to mid 80s Fahrenheit, or around 20 to 29 degrees Celsius. My first two specimens were kept between 68 and 76 degrees Fahrenheit during the winter, and between 72 and 80 degrees Fahrenheit during the summer. Some keepers read about the warm and dry seasons with periodic droughts and immediately designate the species as an arid one. Unfortunately, what many fail to take into account are the rainy seasons in which this spider would be exposed to much more humid and moist conditions. Furthermore, as a burrower, the C. darlingi would construct burrows down into the earth where it would find more moisture and temperate conditions. Although it's true that they are adaptable and adult specimens seem to do well on mostly dry substrate with a water dish, I found that slings and juveniles appreciate moist substrate to start off. Start your spider with moist substrate and allow the top layers to dry out a bit. This will allow your sling to dig to the moisture level it needs. When you notice that the darker band that indicates moist substrate starts to shrink, it's time to add more water. For smaller sling enclosures, I like to use a pipette to direct the water down into the dirt. This makes it easier to avoid flooding the spider's burrow. For tinier slings, a deep dram bottle or 5.5 ounce 30 milliliter deli cup will work great. Larger, more established slings will do well in a 16 to 32 ounce or 0.47 to 0.94 liter deli cup or something around that size. Feel free to experiment with what works for you, but just be sure to keep the ventilation holes small enough that they do not permit escape. If the enclosure size permits, I like to add cork bark and a water dish. All of my slings burrowed right to the bottom, creating an elaborate system of web and forest tunnels with a couple of exits and entrances. Expect that your C. darlingi will also do a bit of webbing on the surface. Behavior-wise, all of my slings were more shy and skittish than defensive. Once they burrowed, I would rarely catch them out of their dens. When disturbed, they would much rather bolt to their dens than stand and fight. That said, this species is very fast and packs potent venom, so caution is always advised during maintenance and rehousings. This species is an excellent eater and I found that mine grow rather quickly. I fed my slings one small roach or cricket twice a week, and all five were voracious eaters and excellent hunters. There is no right or wrong feeding schedule, and many keepers feed their spiders weekly or even bi-weekly. Find a feeding schedule that works for you. If you can't find prey items small enough, slings will scavenge feed off of pre-killed items. Cricket drumsticks, or severed cricket legs, or mealworm sections work great in these situations. Mealworms can also be refrigerated, which means you can save extras and always have them on hand. When they enter pre-molt, slings will often seal their burrows with webbing and dirt and refuse food. If your sling does this, it is normal behavior and their way of putting up the do not disturb sign. Do not try to dig up your sling or force food into the burrow during this period. When the spider is ready to eat again, it will open the burrow and in some cases toss out its old molt. As this is a fast growing species, it won't be long before your little sling puts on some size. As juvenile is a relative term when discussing tarantula size, we will use that term to refer to C. darlingi that have reached the 1.5 to 1.75 inch or 3.8 to 4.45 centimeter mark. 
Depending on temperatures, warmer temps lead to higher metabolisms and faster growth. Many will find their spiders in need of a rehouse in a year or less. There are many suitable enclosures available for juvenile spiders, including small critter keepers and the two-quart clear mainstay canisters sold at Walmart. Personally, I find something between two quarts and one gallon, or 1.89 to 3.79 liters, works well as long as it offers some room for 4 to 5 inches, 10 to 13 centimeters of substrate. As always, I include a cork bark hide with a starter burrow, some sphagnum moss, and a water dish. Also, be sure that the enclosure is well ventilated. I choose to keep part of the substrate moist for my juveniles, and I found that they seem to appreciate it. This is also one of the species that I've caught drinking on several occasions, so they definitely appreciate some moisture. Juveniles are just as voracious as their sling counterparts, and mine easily took down medium crickets and roaches. Once they hit this size, I reduce their feeding schedule to once a week or so. I found that the larger specimens may burst from their burrows to grab prey, offering keepers an opportunity to catch a glimpse of their elusive pets. It should be mentioned that if the species is not given enough substrate to burrow in, it will create its home with copious amounts of webbing. Also, some folks report that their specimens don't burrow and instead opt to web. That said, it's recommended that you give all of your specimens enough substrate to properly burrow. It should be noted that C. darlingi males are much smaller than their female counterparts. My first three C. darlingi were male, and I was actually shocked when the first one matured at around 2 inches. The other two were slightly larger at around 2.5 inches or so, but they were still quite small. Females, on the other hand, reach a max size of 4.5 to 5 inches, or 11.4 to 12.7 centimeters, making them a medium-sized spider. As for adult enclosure size, they will do well in something around 2.5 to 5 gallons, or 9.46 to 19 liters or so. The enclosure in this video is a Reptizoo reptile terrarium that offers about 3.3 gallons, or 12.5 liters of space, and lots of depth. Adults will continue to burrow, so any enclosure has to leave room for several inches of substrate. Personally, I like to give my adult burrowers 7 to 9 inches, or 17.8 to 23 centimeters, to burrow in. Giving them more space definitely won't hurt them, so something around 10 gallons with a lot of substrate will likely lead to a labyrinthine series of tunnels. Again, specimens may do some webbing on the surface, so be sure to leave a bit of space for the white stuff. There are many types of appropriate substrates for spiders, including cocoa fiber, peat, and regular topsoil. Some also like to use a combination of any or all of these to get the desirable properties they need. Vermiculite can also be added to help with water absorption and retention. Feel free to use what works well for you and to experiment with your mixes. The substrate in this enclosure is Terra Arania from the BioDude. In the previous enclosure, I had a mixture of peat, cocoa fiber, topsoil, and vermiculite. As for feeding, young adult and adult specimens can easily take down large crickets, B. dubia, B. lateralis, or superworms. If feeding smaller prey like crickets or B. lateralis, I usually drop in two or three prey items. A nice big fat dubia roach is a great meal post-molt. As with my juveniles, I generally feed my young adults once a week. Keep in mind that if you're feeding your tarantula bigger meals, you can feed them less often. Again, if your specimen stops eating and barricades itself in its burrow, it's likely in pre-molt. When this occurs, keep water available, moisten down a corner of the substrate, and wait for it to reopen its burrow. As an old world tarantula species, the C. darlingi can be fast and defensive. Couple this with potent venom and you have a spider that could pose a problem to those new to the hobby. Unfortunately, this is not a good beginner species. That said, many folks will recommend the rear horn baboon as a good starter old world due to its ease of care and relative shyness. Those looking to make the transition from faster new world tarantulas to old world should definitely consider the C. darlingi. All right, so again, I think the big thing with these guys is a lot of people read that they're an arid species. They take their slings and they immediately drop them into dry substrate and i found that they definitely appreciate moisture as a matter of fact i've done the old trick where i put moist substrate on the bottom dry on top done a little starter burrow and those little guys will go straight down bury burrow right down into the moist substrate i've also found that the larger specimens seem to sometimes appreciate a little moisture i've caught them drinking from the webbing i've caught them drinking from the water dishes so again err on the side of caution give them a choice
choice. If you notice your adult doesn't seem to pay attention at all to the moist spot, then by all means, you can probably let it dry out. Also, as with most fossorial species, if you give them enough room to dig, you will more than likely have a much calmer spider than some people report. I found that with mine, if you give them room to dig, they'd rather bolt to their dens than stand and fight. However, there are a lot of folks out there that try to keep their fossorial species as terrestrials, don't give them a lot of room to dig, and in which case, you'll usually end up with a more defensive spider. Remember, if not given the room to dig, they will construct their own hides, so to speak, out of webbing, and what will end up happening is that webbing will go all the way up to the top of the enclosure, so as soon as you open that enclosure up, you're essentially ripping the top off their house. That's going to cause some of that defensive behavior. But overall, great species. As you can see from the bits of the rehousing video, mine was very calm and relaxing and very shy. So not the monsters they're sometimes portrayed to be. And a lot of people do recommend them as good beginner old world species. So that's enough of me talking. You probably had enough of that. If you enjoyed the video enough to subscribe, you can click that button right up there. If you like the videos and want to check out more, you can check out the videos in here. As always, love to get comments. I try to respond to every single one of them. I do respond to every single one of them. And if you don't hear back from me, shoot me a little nudge. It means I missed it. Hope to catch you guys all next time.